Hi everyone, thank you for joining today's webinar presentation, A Tale of Different Software Innovations, The Uneven Impact of Alice. I'm Gail Martin, Associate Marketing Manager at LexisNexis IP, and I want to cover a couple things before we get started. Please feel free to submit your questions during the conference by using the Q&A feature, the questions feature on your dashboard. You can download a copy of today's slides from the panel under the handout section. These and a link to the recording from today's presentation will also be sent to you. I'd like to introduce today's presenters, Jean Quinn. Jean's the founder of IPWatchdog.com, a patent attorney, law professor, and leading commentator on patent law and innovation policy. Jean was recently named one of the world's leading IP strategists by IAM for the second consecutive year. Kate Godry. Kate Godry, PhD, is a partner at Kilpatrick Townsend and focuses on data-driven and strategic patent prosecution. She's authored over 50 publications sharing results of generally applicable analyses. Dr. Godry also frequently consults with legal services companies to help avail big data, statistical, and artificial intelligence tools to prosecution professionals. She holds a JD from Harvard Law a PhD in computational neurobiology from USCD, UCSD, and a BS in physics from Fort Hayes State University. John White. John White is a US patent attorney and a patent lecturer. He is an adjunct law professor at the University of Virginia School of Law, and also the principal lecturer author of the PLI patent, review, patent Bar Review course, a course that he originally created. Since 1995, John has personally taught close to 50% of all practicing patent attorneys and patent agents how to successfully become admitted to the patent bar. He's also taught numerous U.S. patent examiners at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. John serves as an expert witness in patent litigation and is regarded as a leading authority on patent practice and procedure. I'm rounding out today's session is Bob Stoll. Bob Stoll is a partner and co-chair of the IP group at Drinker Biddle and he has retired after almost 30 years as a commissioner with the USPTO. Thank you again, everyone, for attending today's presentation. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Gene. All right, thanks a lot, Gail. And thank you all for being here today and spending a portion of your Thursday afternoon with us or Thursday morning, or I suppose if you're in Europe, Thursday evening. Uh, we have a very important topic to talk about today, and I know there's a lot of interest in this, so let's just get going. But before I get going, what I'd like to do is I'd like to make you aware that this is not exactly a part three of a series, but we've been doing webinars that have discussed software patents in light of Alice and Mayo here for the last couple months. One we did a few weeks ago, lessons from what we call were the lighthouse cases, the key cases, and that you can access on uh, IP Watchdog. That was also sponsored by Lexus Nexus. And then we did one in November on the problem for artificial intelligence. And this is something that's gonna come up throughout our conversation here today as well. So if you're interested in this topic, I recommend you go back and listen to those uh, more detailed web webinars that go into those specific issues uh, in depth. Now, here's the outline for today. And this is usually where I stop and pull in the speakers, but I'm gonna push past this a little bit and sort of set the table a bit more than I might normally, um, because I wanna show you this slide. This is one that we're gonna come back to throughout the presentation, and it's a bit alarming. If you look at since January 2016, the percentage of 101 rejections in the key software areas, including in um, artificial intelligence and bioinformatics and business methods and all kinds of different software, you're looking at 80 to 100% of all applications getting a 101 rejection. And those lines that are going increasing up towards 100% are the artificial intelligence art units. So this is alarming. Now let's just quickly set the table so everybody is on the same page. This is the obligatory Alice slide Alice Mayo, there's the framework. It, you start with the statute. You ask, is there a claim that covers a process, a machine, a manufacturer, composition of matter? And then if the answer is yes, the Supreme Court has mandated two further steps to decide whether or not, in their view, the claim is patent eligible. Now, the 
Federal Circuit gave some important guidance in Berkheimer recently, and then the Patent Office issued their Berkheimer guidance to examiners and essentially said to examiners under the second step of the Alex test to be, you can only issue a, re, uh, a patent eligibility rejection under 2B if it fits into one of these four different criteria. And we'll come back and talk about this as well. And when the Patent Office attacked the issues brought up by 2A, which is the judicial exceptions themselves, the revised guidance, which came out this January, said that this approach has become impractical. So the Patent Office has had to try and do something since nobody else is really doing anything to bring any kind of sanity to the issue. So they have issued this guidance here, and now they've broken down the 2A inquiry into also a step one and a step two to see whether the claim recites a judicial exception, and if it does, is there a practical application? So what we see is the Patent Office is trying to break the Alice Mayo test down into a series of binary questions so that examiners can apply them in some kind of objective way. Now that brings us to one of the latest decisions, which is the Athena case. And Bob, I want to turn to you first because uh, I'm first, thank you for joining us last minute and thank you for also letting us publish your uh, op-ed on IP Watchdog uh, just yesterday, I guess it was. You have some opinions about where we are now after Athena. What what are your I thoughts? Um, thank you, and and it's my pleasure to publish with IP Watchdog and to participate in all of your activities. I think they're great for bringing awareness of the issues to the public. Um, I do have some concerns with what happens to the January 7th, 2019 guidelines now that we have the Athena case, which came out after the guidelines at issue. So I, I am well aware, having done rules at the PTO myself as commissioner, that um, these particular rules are not substantive rulemaking. Um, they, are, they are not applicable to the courts. The examiners, and in this instance, the PTAB, are required by the actual guidelines themselves to follow the guidelines. But the courts are not. And after uh, the majority in, uh, in the Athena case uh, it, it determined that, in fact, uh, uh, they were not uh, allowed to uh, allow the claims based upon Supreme Court precedents, they dropped a, a footnote, footnote four, where they basically lamented the fact that they couldn't hold in a different manner. Um, and so that's causing me a little bit of concern that they may not adopt the the guidelines themselves. I will say it was a split decision, and uh, the the minority did say, "Hey, in this instance, um, we don't have just a diagnostic method. We have a series of steps, and the claims need to be considered um, on the whole." And that gave me a little bit of hope, but I still have significant concerns about what happens to these guidelines when they get to the court. And they should get to the court fairly quickly because they apply to the PTAB, we're seeing cases come out there, and they apply to examiners. So I think we're gonna find uh, the court reviewing these guidelines very shortly, but I'm worried. Yeah, I'm worried too. And you know, and when you just talk about the methods, I have an article coming out in IP Watchdog, it'll be published this afternoon, and it'll be the first article at the top of our newsletter in the morning. and it will look at Mayo specifically, and, and I am gonna say that if Congress wants to do the one thing that can be the best benefit here, it's to expressly overrule Mayo. And if you look at, at Deere, then uh, Associate Justice Rehnquist said that letting questions of novelty creep into 101, particularly with respect to method claims, is inappropriate. You know, so we see the Supreme Court has explicitly overruled Deere. And, you know, and th this is really problematic. Now, we're going to talk about what we can do about this at some point in time. But it, the first thing that we have to understand, John and Kate, I want to bring you guys in now, is that there is really disparate treatment at the patent office. John. 
there is. And I, I think that uh, it, it's easy enough to say that uh, we're going to give you patents if you have a practical application of something that seems otherwise directed to a uh, an exception. You know, that's that's the middle part of the of the guideline. And that would seemingly address uh, Athena in that this was a practical application. Right. So that guideline seems contrary uh, almost exactly to what uh, was decided in Athena, where they seem to ignore the practical application, which is uh, the diagnosis. But the fact is, uh, some methods are more able to be patented than others, because if you have software that's doing something tangible, like in my mechanical world, you know, adjusting a machine tool or mirror or temperature or something, well, there's a practical application. But if you're diagnosing, well, what's the practical application that, that you're looking for? I think that's practical, but that wouldn't be recognized. And so you'd get very, very different treatment for things that shouldn't be treated differently at all. Yeah, th th this is really, um, I, I find it alarming. And, you know, Kate, I know you've got, so I'm going to push here the slide where, you know, I, I looked at this and this was, created by um, Megan M McLaughlin, who many of you will, will know Megan if you've been on our webinars in the, in the past. And she created this using Patent Advisor and uh, the data to give us an idea of what is really happening at the Patent Office in terms of the percentage of 101 rejections. And, um, you know, it's it's not all bad news. So we don't want to like necessarily rain on your prey because there are patents being issued. And what we have seen is um, Director Yonku has made a difference, and but there are still one-on-one rejections, right, Kate? I mean, this is something we talked about as we were just looking at this data. What are your thoughts? Right. So what this data shows and what the data we've looked at before and some of my studies have sh has shown is that in the AI art units and in the um, business method art units, when there's an office action, the chances of there being a 101 rejection in that office action are very high. Um, what's improved is that we're now getting some allowances. So it used to be that almost all, especially in the business method, almost all of the actions coming out of the office that, uh, were rejections, not allowances, and that's changing a bit. And we're seeing some change in the AI art units as well because the allowance rate had dipped down pretty substantially. And, and um, I, I think we're seeing signs of it uh, coming back in, in recent months. Now, the problem with I, that, I gotta, though, I, oh, go ahead, I've Bob. Gotta, I want to I want to clarify something that I've noticed. Um, when they started applying the 101 out of Alice and Mayo. I noticed that certain areas, art units within 1600 and some of the art units within um, 3600 and some of the art units uh, in, scattered across the offices were, were employing a 101 rejection. I initially did not see the 101 rejection in the pure computer software art. I saw it more in the areas dealing with gaming and that type of thing. And then something happened in, let me call it the November time frame of 2017, where I started noticing all of a sudden an uptick in, in rejections in, let's call it the 70, class 705 area, which dealt with software. I, I don't know what happened during that time frame. I can't really figure it out, but all of a sudden I started seeing an uptick. So there has been an evolution with respect to what's going on at the PTO. And hopefully these new guidance, which just became effective on January 7th of this year, are beginning to curb the uh, unusual number of high, high rejections in cases now that have understood the problem and addressed it. They've, they actually now are bulking up with respect to what they include in the specification. They're providing for some sort of uh, technological improvement and they're explaining it. They're putting detailed alg algorithms in the specification and claiming them functionally. So these claims that are now being rejected are much better than the ones when all of this started. And I am hopeful, and I recognize that's not a plan, that we are going to see as the education takes hold at the PTO that we see a decrease in the number of 101 rejections coming out of the Patent and Trademark Office. Yeah, you know, there's there's a lot a lot there, and and I think um, 
I think, Kate, when we did the last one or the first webinar uh, dealing with artificial intelligence, we kind of put our finger on one of the things that happened. And I don't know whether it was in 2017. It might have been before that. When when was it that electric power grid was electric issued? Power group. I think it was August 2017, if I remember correctly. So yeah. that was kind of the turning point um, that we attributed the inflection that we saw the same inflection yeah. of. Um, okay. But that seemed to make sense. What I think the patent office is doing is it's looking at the cases that are coming out, uh, which is good, should be. And then it's saying, well, what do we need to do with this? So it looks at the patents and they have this nice ind indexing system set up. So already they can say, well, what kind of patent is this? What examiners, what types of examiners do we need to train? And it's easy for them to look at that, you know, at, at least, you know, based on one approach uh, for figuring that out. And so they say, okay, where were the patents assigned? What art units, what classes? Then let's go train them. And so Alice was straight business methods. They trained the business method examiners and there's a dramatic and quick response. Um, although, I mean, there's a few additional areas that were influenced by that as well. Yeah, so Jean's going here. So bioinformatics was also one area that had a dramatic response and that was not in Alice. It was kind of interesting. Um, but in the AI art units, as you had mentioned, um, it was under generally, it was really unaffected by Alice. And then things changed in about 2017, as you said, which aligned with the electric power group and had, which dealt with these types of patents. Yeah, so now, Kate, we're looking at your slide here dealing with the percentage of one-on-one -on -one rejections and then the percentage of, of, of allowances. And we are seeing like, for example, in the, uh, even in business methods and in bioinformatics particularly, the allowances are, are going up. Um, mm -hmm. They were pretty, pretty low. So any movement up would be noticeable. We have a question about how many of these rejections, because um, we're talking about 80 to 100% of applications getting one-on-one -on -one rejections, how many of them end the prosecution? And uh, I don't know that we've specifically looked at that yet, but that's sort of the next thing to look at. But it's, I think it's our belief that a lot of them do wind up ending the prosecution. And that's why you wind up seeing allowance rates going up, but the rejection rate being so high, correct? I don't think so. So the reason why I use these metrics, and to be clear, what the left graph shows, because this is a frequently... Um, both of these graphs can be misinterpreted. So uh, the percentage of office actions, so not total off actions with a 101 rejection. So this doesn't mean that every time the patent office is pushing uh, out a paper, you know, sending it to the applicant, that it includes a 101 rejection. It might be an allowance. So it does, um, not everything necessarily gets a 101 rejection. Um, and to your point in terms of what, why, what we can say about uh, abandonments and overall um, allowance rates. The reason why we chose not to look at that in this study is because these metrics are much faster to show what's going on. If we wait for applicants to realize when allowance rates are dipping, and then you know, it'll take them two or three or five or 10 office actions to say, you know, it's not worth it anymore. And that's years. And so if we're waiting to actually see the dip in allowance rates, um, you won't understand what's going on in the patent office. That's why we chose these. So Jean, it's true that there may be some influence of um, abandonments in these statistics. I think that a lot of what we're seeing with the general time correlation though, I, indicates that there's at least some factor of what's going on at the patent office. So we can kind of make explanations for why um, the allowance rates are improving in the bioinformatics and the business method um, art units. So for example, in the business methods, they have a new technology center or a new um, director of those art units. And he's really favorable uh, for applicants. He wants the examiners to work with applicants to figure out what, if anything, is patentable. Um, and we had the Berkheimer memo, memo, and now we have some new guidance, right? So there's a lot of reasons why this might be going up, aside from just abandonment. Yeah. Uh, the two reasons I see are basically cultural, which you just mentioned. And I think you're absolutely right, Kate, that, you know, you need to work on the culture at the PTO to encourage them to, to 
help the applicant to find allowable subject matter. The other one is better applications coming in. I mean, we draft a lot of artificial intelligence applications. Um, I recognize that there isn't an artificial uh, intelligence art unit or group. They're scattered throughout the office. But over the years of having had problems, we have learned to modify the way we draft applications and claim subject matter so that we show some sort of tangible result, like quicker learning or those types of things. And I think that type of practice is also reducing the problems that we're having with respect to getting AI applications allowed. Yeah, you know, I want to go back to this slide again, and this is one that I think we're going to spend a lot of time on today, because um, if we're going to talk about uneven application of Alice and Mayo or disparate treatment, there's a lot of things that go into that. And I think one of the things Bob is pointing out right now is, is that the way that you draft applications obviously is going to wind up influencing how it is that you wind up getting treated at the office. Now, not all of this is being explained based on applications being drafted in less than optimal ways. But what I will tell you is, is I won't tell you what the company is, but I just spoke, I gave a keynote speech at the Utah IP Summit a couple of weeks ago, and I spoke with um, director of patents for a large software corporation that was there. And he was shocked when I was talking about the people having difficulty in the artificial intelligence area and getting one-on-one -on -one rejections because he came up to me afterwards and he said that we just aren't having any similar problems with our patents. We're not getting one-on-one -on -one rejections. So now then the question becomes, is it because of who they are or is it because their applications are written better, written in a certain way, or is it they're getting assigned in a different part of the patent office and it probably is a little bit of all of those things you know and that makes it extremely difficult and i'd like to get all three of you to comment on that and kate let's start with you i mean because you're the data person i mean what 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 do you think in terms of why you may have well, a different why, why experience do you, well, why do you yeah exactly yeah, i agree there's there's a lot of reasons for it i think I can't recall if it was on one of our last talks. You, I think you presented it, Gene, um, some patent advisor data that illustrates even the variability across examiners within a single art unit. Now, I will say like that goes away once you're starting to go to averages that hit an extreme. Like if 100% of the office actions have one-on-one -on -one rejections, and then there's no variability across the examiners, right? Right. Um, but there's enough little factors that can explain why one company is different than another. Like you said, Gene, even the name, right? The name of the company in terms of who the examiner is dealing with, that psychologically starts out that conversation differently. The attorneys that are used, the way the case is drafted, the overall application of the technology, very, very seldom is AI technology an innovation that's straight focused on AI. There's usually a reason why the AI's um, techniques are being used, a specific application for it. So then once you're layering that on, um, you know, what additional considerations does it bring? What other art units might it bring the, um, the application into? So there's all these additional factors. I mean, the fact that you said that that's, it's a software company, I don't think that the application um, is probably the distinguishing feature, but it might it might still explain why like in 2122, it may include many other uh, applications, patent applications that have other use cases that aren't focused as directly on software and perhaps that's um, not favorable for them. Yeah, so, so Bob, I mean, you know what people think. You know that people think <laughs> that if it's um, a Microsoft, and that's not who this was. But I, I it, don't it, agree with you, though. I don't think that's true. I mean, I, I can tell like, you oh, as an ex-examiner that I didn't. Okay. You know that people think that, though, right? Uh, I, I, I didn't look to see who the Astony was when I was examining an application. I just did not look at that. So I don't think that's 
the issue. I think what happens is people steeped in AI, some of these software companies that you're talking about, have dealt with the patent office in the same type of subject matter many, many, many times and have learned what they can get patents on. And I think that they are crafty in drafting an application that can pass muster under 101 in these particular areas. So I think that's one thing that has happened. And the second thing I think that has happened is that, in fact, things that they don't believe they can get by patent, they're protecting by trade secret now, which is something they didn't do before the Federal Trade Secret Act as much. I, I'd like to to talk about that a little more though, I, I disagree. And so, I mean, the world of artificial intelligence examination has changed. And I've seen this with just through interviews with examiners. It used to be, you could get almost anything through. There were times I went into an interview with and transferred in case and the examiner was ready to allow it. And I said, no, you can't allow this. Like I want to amend the claims. This is too broad, it's crazy. Um, and that's not the case anymore. And so if you were a very experienced company, that knew what types of patent applications you could get through the patent office, you know, two years ago, even a year ago, it's different now. So I think it's not just that their experience has lent them to draft applications in this very strategic way that means that they're immune from 101 because that has changed the whole world of it, right? So they wouldn't know that unless they've seen it and been part of it with the rest of us. But it is different now, but I think it's actually better now. We've had Yanku kind of expressing his opinion, even before these guidelines come out, that he believed that we should be narrowly construing Alice Mayo et al. I think what is happening is we also now have guidelines applicable to both the PTAB and the examining corps, and I think he's making himself quite clear. So I I'm not seeing as much of a problem with AI applications as as maybe some others are. I, I, I have significant experience here in, in drafting them, so we know what to do to be able to get them through, and we're getting them through. And I'm seeing an uptick in allowances uh, since the guidelines have come in, out. Now, that's anecdotal. I don't know whether that transcends different areas, but I am seeing an uptick and I'm seeing better cases coming out of the PTAB as well. All right, let me, let me bring John into this because John, and the reason why I wanted John to be here for this is many of you may not know this, but John has uh, started doing work in the bioinformatics space. And probably a lot of you know that John is uh, a patent prosecution um, wizard, I suppose you might say, and he's helped a lot of people with a variety of different technologies over the years who have had, um, I guess you might say hurdles, right? You know, and have had some difficulty getting patents and you've come in and you, you even with patents that you, you know, you, you didn't write, you were able to, you know, you prosecute or you help and you advise and so forth. And I know you've done that for a variety of different technologies, including computer technologies. So, What's the what's the magic, I guess? I mean, you know, and, and I mean, and I say that, you know, knowing what you've done and I know that others on the other side don't really know exactly what you've done. But it seems to me that, you know, there's two pieces here. There's the drafting of it. And then there's that. Well, how do you actually convince the examiner part of it within the framework that we're given, which Director Yanku is trying to make sense of, but is still pretty mushy? Well, you know, my approach doesn't vary regardless of the subject matter that I'm working on. I want to uh, recruit uh, the examiner as a colleague to help uh, us collectively guard, you know, this public exchange of the patent that we get in exchange for the disclosure that, that the public gets. And so I'm always very solicitous to the examiner and I generally agree uh, with their concerns about the claims and the application in its present form, but let's collectively find a way forward. And so when you when you get the examiner to buy in that you and they are on the same team, uh, generally a very successful conversation can be had. Now, I do think the brand name you represent has some influence. I don't think it's the overarching factor though, because when I was an examiner, likewise, you know, the same as for Bob, you know, that really is not a factor. But, you know, if General Motors submitted a transmission application that I was working on, I tend to think, 
yeah, there's probably something here, you know, but aside from that, no, you know, it wasn't a factor. The greater factor was the attorney uh, that you're working with. If they have done a lot in this area and you've worked with them before, you, you find them a reliable partner uh, that you can uh, work something out with. Now, as for me, let's, let's not discount sheer luck. I have one anecdote here. <laughs> Uh, it just it just reveals it. Okay, this is going to ruin your your <laughs> reputation. But go no, ahead. No, I was called in. You know, a guy uh, in our office was working on a uh, a therapy. It was a, a process for monitoring uh, physical therapy for wheelchair bound people to help them move enough in order to avoid uh, sores and stuff like that and monitor them throughout the day. And they were facing an implacable electric power base rejection. Uh, and they summoned me to, you know, John, go do what you can. And, and all I did was wait and Berkheimer came out. <laughs> and I go to talk to the examiner and he goes, well, that, that rejection's withdrawn. And I said, well, thank you. And <laughs> And he said nothing, he I, just, you know, <laughs> so like the legend of the wizard just continues to grow, you know, it's unbelievable. But, but what I'm saying is, you know, cause we, we have people concerned, oh my gosh, this is the end of the road. We're, you know, this is the end of our ability to get pens. Wait six months. <laughs> See, and that's, you know, and that Kate is to your point, why some of this is very difficult to wait until you see the allowance numbers um, because so many of these, folks are getting these rejections, facing these issues, and then filing to keep the papers alive so that in six months, a year, 18 months, things will look different. Yeah, we saw yeah. a lot of that right away after Alice, where people were just putting things up on appeal, wanting to wait it out, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bob, you wanted to say yeah, something? Yeah, but now we have a little bit of an advantage in that we're drafting the applications that eventually are going to be examined by the uh, by the examiners. We can take a particular action. None of us know for sure where all this 101 is going to go. So what I'm doing is I am bulking up my applications in the hopes that the there is some sense in the 101 handling, and eventually I'm going to be able to get some piece of a claim that I'm intending. I do something similar to what John does. I I don't exactly butter up initially to the examiner because I don't know which examiner is going to be handling my application, but I make sure that my application is telling a story, that I am in, when I'm writing these things, I am telling how I'm getting a technological solution to a very important problem. And then I agree with John when you, I engage with all of the examiners. I think that having an interview is extremely important. You're establishing a relationship with them. They're handling the application. You're drafting similar applications. You're going to be before the examiner again. It's good to establish that rapport and work together to be able to get an allowed case. So, you know, okay, I'm going to take moderator's prerogative for a minute and speak for one minute here because, you know, I'm sitting here, Bob, and nodding my head up and down in complete and total agreement with you. and Sometimes I wonder whether we are in this echo chamber among ourselves because, you know, we talk about this all the time ourselves. We are inside, uh, all four of us are inside the Beltway. We attend programs, uh, which are also attended by some of the judges on the federal circuit and, and people at the patent office and the directors and the commissioners and folks like that. And we stay very well informed about what's going on when we read the cases and we hear from them as well. And we know that what you just said is exactly what you need to do. And I, when I was out at Utah and I was talking to people, I had tremendous pushback mm -hmm. from uh, patent attorneys on the front line telling me it's all about the claims. It's not about the specification. And I told them, and I finally told one of them, I said, look, I get what you're saying, but you're wrong. You know, yes, the claims are what's going to be wind up being examined. But if you do not have a story and support and explanation of what the innovation actually is in your specification, you are either going to lose an examination or if you get a patent and it winds up being valuable, yeah. you're going to lose later on. And it was a bit surprising to me that in the outside the beltway, 
for lack of a better phrase, the people who are doing the the work for the for the masses and the corporations and the inventors who don't hear what we hear from the the decision makers all the time don't get the same message and i don't know how to convey it i guess thoughts on that anybody we're doing it now yeah i mean i know but i mean <sighs> Jane, to your point though in the athena case um that john's uh, and you are a better expert than me on uh, there were repeated references to what was in the specification in terms of these techniques that were in the claims that Athena was resting its case on, trying to say, look, it's not all about the correlation. There's a lot of techniques that we're using, which is a decent argument to make. But in their specification, they repeatedly say, you know, these are standard techniques. Use the yeah. normal techniques of the art, right? And so the and th those were quoted, I think, about three times, those passages in the spec. I have a feeling that, that was probably the turning point of the case. Right, and that's the death knell under Berkheimer. That's Berkheimer one. You lose express statements in the specification. John, now John is actually in the studio here with me at, at uh, IP Watchdog, and he's nodding his head. And you've had these experiences too. Attorneys really push back. Yeah, they do, and they're wrong. Uh, you know, I, I can't, uh, you, you know, that's just, just how it goes down. You know, you've got to tell the story and you've got to get buy-in with the examiner. And then, of course, the claims have to reflect uh, that, uh, you know, that reality. You, you know, you, you can't have a claim that's so broad it, it sort of draws in all kinds of ancillary stuff from the spec. No, it's got to be there in the claim, but you got to get buy-in with the examiner. And, you know, Athena is just wrong. You know, let's just say it. Yeah. <laughs> it's just wrong. You know? it, it is wrong. And I guess, you know, j before I just get off my soapbox and we come back to the, the presentation here, um, what, what I would just say is, and for those of you who are on, I, I beat this drum and I have people come on these webinars and we talk about this who are, who are informed and know what's going on. And we go to these presentations and we talk to these folks both on and off the record, and we try and bring it to you. So this is not just my opinion. This is not just what Gene thinks of the world. This is what Gene has synthesized based on what he's hearing. Um, so when you're when you're arguing with me and Bob and John and Kate, you're really arguing with not just with us. You're arguing with the people who are informing our decisions, in our in our opinions. And um, and I guess I'll just come off the soapbox there, but. Um, one of the things, Kate, I wanted to let me see if I can find it. Let me put my glasses back on so I can find this because let's let's push a bit of good news before we move past this too far. This was the promise. And, and I know with the Athena case and all that's going on, uh, this whole webinar was going to be about bioinformatics. And this got a mm -hmm. little bit sidetracked, but you wanted to give people some hope. <laughs> Yeah. Now, bioinformatics, stepping back a little bit, is a really important field. And I actually thought it would take off a lot more than it has, uh, at least in the, in the patenting realm, because my view on it is that all of biology is going to need computers. You need to start doing smart designs. You need to start doing modeling uh, for efficiency, for safety, for everything. And so I think it's going to take off much more so than we're even seeing right now. So it's an important field. But in the patent world, it's, it creates complexities because it's kind of software. So you have the software complexities and it's kind of biology. So you have the biology complexities. Like right now, what we're talking about, the Alice decision, you know, abstract ideas that applies to bioinformatics, the law of nature, the Athena decision that applies to bioinformatics. So it's its own beast. But what our data was uh, concentrated on was mainly Alice and showing that it was strongly affected by Alice as in a similar manner to the business methods. But to your point, um, what you were saying, Gene, it seems to have more than recovered. So the allowance rate, uh, as we were calculating it, which was you know the percentage of actions coming out of the patent office that were allowances, uh, now it has exceeded the pre-Alice levels. So that's very encouraging. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it is bouncing back. Things are improving. But, you know, this kind of brings us back, Bob, to the question about for, for how long, I suppose. Right. You know, and um, well, we were at a lunch on on Monday and we were talking about what what is Congress going to do? And Congress is actually 
at least a handful of the key players on both Democrat Republican side in the House and the Senate are meeting with stakeholders to talk about what to do. And it seems like they're starting from a blank slate and they're going to move something forward here. Um, and one of the folks that is involved in that, I, I asked him and said, well, what can uh, average folks do? And his answer was that we need more voices to explain that innovation is um, driven by patents and the importance of this issue. Um, Bob, do you want to share any information that you have or talk about that effort or what's going on? Well, first of all, I think that no matter what's going on, sharing the importance of uh, innovation for the United States is something we should be doing regularly anyway. So, I, I mean, I, I think we are remiss if we do not keep the mainstream newspapers uh, flooded with the importance of innovation in improve, improving the human condition, period. Um, now, that being said, uh, I, I, I do remember the lunch and I remember the comments. And Gene, I do believe that we will see introduction of some sort of legislation with respect to 101, maybe as early as this summer. But I do not anticipate anything being enacted. Um, I think there's going to be a lot more going on on the Hill that are going to occupy the judiciary um, than IP. Um, I, I also believe that there are several companies, powerful companies, that are interested in maintaining the status quo. Um, and I also think that we haven't come together and had any type of agreement on a particular legislative framework or language. So I don't think, at least in the short term, we have any likelihood of any legislation being enacted, which is why I drafted the letter that I did, that, that you posted on Athena, encouraging the judges to be uh, looking at um, significantly more um, in distinguishing from some of the Supreme Court uh, precedents. And I think that is uh, one of the likely ways of seeing some reform or change. I also think Director Yanku is doing a great job trying um, to, to make sure that we are seeing uh, Alice being applied limitedly as it's intended in the own decision. So there is where I think we, we have an option of having greater impact earlier. I don't think we have any likelihood of legislation any time soon. And, and I just think that's the way it is. So I think we need to work with what we've got. And I totally believe we should be flooding the uh, newspapers and airwaves about the importance of innovation. And the fact that uh, Europe and even China seem to be doing better in these particular areas than we are. Yeah, and I want to echo that last part, too, because the way that things work in D.C. is just the submission of the legislation is going to matter in the view of the courts, the federal circuit and the Supreme Court, because they're gonna see this as, as a real important issue that have brought in stakeholders together over a period of time. And we know that that has shifted the federal circuit views and we know that that has shifted Supreme Court views. Having said that, if this is an issue that's important to you or your clients, you can't wait and say, well, we don't expect something is going to happen legislatively this term, which I would agree with Bob. I don't foresee this happening in the short term. But if you're not going to get involved now, by the time you decide to get involved, it will be too late. And um, so word to the wise, get involved now if it matters to you and your clients, because by the time you know that you need to be involved, you'll be able to affect nothing. And that's just unfortunately the way that Washington works. Now, we do have a question, John, uh, on the second prong here, the significantly more prong mm -hmm. and that Bob just raised. And it asks about getting past the 101 rejection. Uh, if you get past the 101 rejection by a technical, technological, technological improvement, when might the technical improvement lose its, quote, improvement argument because it is lost its novelty status. Yeah, that, 
That's an interesting question, and it's one that I don't think you have to worry about simply because uh, a technological improvement is a technological improvement. I mean, in areas that I work in uh, more often, you know, if you're talking about, uh, you know, a brake on a car or something like that, and you're talking about the brake material, well, they're all going to result in faster stopping, lower heat generation, or less wear, you know. And as long as you have that occurring, you know, that technological improvement, uh, you're good to go. You know, there's nothing else you have to add. And so I think in the computer realm and the, you know, and this is especially applicable to bioinformatics because it's the classic scenario of big data about big data. You know, there's no other way but using computers and algorithms and so forth to deal with this. This is not something that's transferable from any other, you know, pen and paper sort of technique. Uh, it's not practicable and not even feasible, you know, uh, and so you've got to say this makes it faster, this uses less memory, this requires less processing, and that has to be sufficient. Now, the, the problem here is the word significantly. That carries a lot of subjectivity in it. You know, what is significantly more? Well, that depends on your uh, view of the world. You know, I much prefer the guidelines that just say practical application. You know, that's a, a much more understandable and much less subjective threshold. And, uh, you know, you just have to hope that, uh, you know, the CAFC is paying attention and uh, can convince themselves and then perhaps even the Supreme Court that, the significantly more thing is inherently subjective. It's applied almost in a random fashion and it's just not working. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, Kate, uh, you've been quiet for a little bit. So I want to do you have any thoughts on what we've been saying here now before I move into sort of the, the last phase of the, the program? No, I mean, I've, I've been in agreement with you on all the points. <laughs> OK, well. One of the things that I wanted to specifically mention here is, is that, you know, you've got to figure out a way to deal with all these issues, right? The the world is falling apart. Humpty Dumpty has fallen down and we've got to try and figure <laughs> out a way to put them back together because after all, that is our job right now. Um, the unfortunate reality of the patent office is the vast majority of patents are granted by a small, very small percentage of examiners. And, and that probably is not particularly shocking, right? There's a number of examiners at the patent office in certain areas that work for the no patent for you authority. We know that. There's a number of examiners that are junior examiners that are uh, haven't allowed anything because they've just been recently hired, you know? And there's examiners that don't ever allow anything because they're not examining anymore. They're on special assignment and those sorts of things, right? So there's always the worker bees in any organization. So how do you, what LexisNexis has done is try to figure out, well, how do you know who you've been assigned to? And looking at an allowance, uh, time to allowance sometimes can be a little bit misleading. So what they've come up with is how likely is it that the examiner that you've been assigned to is going to, the next time they pick up an office action, going to issue an allowance. So they score these as green, yellow, and red examiners, where the green examiners are going to issue um, uh, office actions more frequently. The yellow examiners are sort of in the middle, and the red examiners are going to issue a whole lot more rejections to any office action uh, allowance. And here's an example. What you would normally probably expect to see is like a bell curve in any organization. So sometimes you'll see it out of whack. Sometimes you'll see like in semiconductors where you have a lot of large companies that know how to write the applications as we've been talking about. They know how to argue them and they're not, you know, they're not necessarily trying to get the broad claims where you're pounding your chest. You get a lot more allowances. So you have a lot more green examiners. And then in an area where 3,600, where that's where some of the business method art units are, you get more of the red examiners. And then you come to something like, what is the next slide? Now, oops. If I just put that up there, <laughs> and Kate, you, and you can't participate because you know what <laughs> art units these are from because you helped me create. What do you suppose, what area do you suppose these examiners are from? 
Bob, any thoughts? 3,600. Wow. 3,600. Okay, now the interesting thing about 3,600 <laughs> is all, and none of them are green and almost all of them are red. And so I now agree. the interesting thing about 3,600, when you look at 3,600 too, is, is if you look at the data, they, and you look at, say, like the top 20 art units with the highest allowance rates and the top 20 art units with the lowest allowance rates, 10 will be from 3,600 in each list, which is kind of bizarre. So you can't just say, oh, I've been assigned to 3,600. Whoa, he's me. You, some of you are assigned to 3,600, and it's like, thank God I've been assigned to 3,600. Um, so one of the things I personally think you need to have an idea about in this big data age is who are you assigned to and what is the likelihood that you're going to be looking at having a long and protracted uh, prosecution or something that you can do in a, in a more reasonably quick and get actually get to an allowance. Um, now, Kate, this is your bailiwick. I know you're the expert on using these kinds of data driven strategies. What kind of strategies do you recommend when somebody is looking at this kind of a universe? Well, there's different points in time to look at this data. So if you're familiar with this data from the start, when you're first talking with inventors, when you're first deciding whether to pursue a patent application or on what particular aspect of a technology to focus uh, an application on, um, then you can use this information to inform these decisions. And so if you're talking with somebody and they're describing um, a something that's going to likely fall in one of the business method art units that has to do with uh, health tech and then you can dig a little deeper and say well you know there's surely a security aspect here because we're talking about health data like what's going on there or um there's perhaps a data storage um issue so what's going on there and you go through all of the uh, uh possible details that are happening at 2100 that are behind the scenes. And usually that's what it takes to get an application out of 3600 is looking behind the scenes at how something's actually working. Um, so that's from the start. If you can see where you don't want to go and try to properly focus your application and your invention, what you're trying to protect, um, to go beyond that, when I say this carefully, but kind of superficial level, and get into a place of the patent office that's more favorable. So that's one approach for it. And, but then once you're there, you're there. And so you wanna have some realistic strategies about how you're going to get through prosecution as efficiently and effectively as possible. There's no reason why, and I've seen it, I've seen cases where you have 15 office actions. That's a tremendous waste of money. That will eat up your patent budget faster than anything else. So once you find yourself in one of these art units, you need to have a clear plan of attack. Um, either you, you can try for a short while and abandon the case, or you can try appealing, or you can try uh, many of the different uh, patent office programs that are offered now, such as um, pre-appeal or AFCP that have some involvement of a supervisor. You could uh, ask for a supervisor to come to your interviews. And I certainly agree with um, John and Bob's previous sentiments about interviewing. Um, but generally, you just don't, or you, you can appeal, right, and get in front of um, different parties in that respect. But you don't want to blindly go through prosecution and just throw money out the window when you're in 3689. That can be a very painful and expensive process. Yeah, you know, and getting to appeal. And um, we did a webinar on this, all these strategies as well. And I think it was Steve Coonan, I believe, joined us with some of these strategies to you know maybe accelerate one because um if you tr use track one then there's this um it seems anecdotally that different examiners get assigned but one of the things i wanted to pick up specifically what kate said when you're there you're there i think it's very important for people to realize that once you get into one of these art units getting out of one of those getting out is very very difficult maybe even impossible so what you want to do is that first filing is going to be very very important 
So when she says, go past that superficial to see what else is there, you got to do that with the first filing and, uh, and try and direct where this application is going to go. And LexisNexis has got another tool. It's called Patent Optimizer um, that if you're interested, it kind of helps you do that. But Bob, any thoughts on that? Because, I mean, that is one of the things that if you can move your application around with, while still protecting the innovation, that, that a lot of times has got some benefits to it. It definitely does. I mean, I, I actually uh, take a look at the classification code, so I kind of understand where things fall out, and I do use Patent Optimizer. Uh, and I also sometimes, you know, look for um, where I find a more of a likelihood uh, of an allowance, and I craft the, the claims in a manner that would make them fall out in a particular area. You can't do it for a particular examiner, but you can do it for a, a, a relative classification. So that's one thing you can do. Uh, the, I, I can't advise my clients to um, do track one because of the costs for each application. So I don't normally do that as a mechanism. I do draft the applications to go to the likelier areas. Um, I also believe in wholeheartedly in engaging the examiner early and often. And if I do run into a problem examiner, I do ask for an SPE and or a QAS, a quality person, uh, and I go in physically and interview the cases and explain um, why the examiner is wrong. I, I personally believe that when you have, uh, now it's, it's hard macroscopically to say, you know, what's right and what's wrong. I, when I was an examiner, examined in some of the areas that have the oldest patents in the United States. Like um, I was uh, metallurgy and potash, the oldest patent is in there. So my yeah. allowance rate was low, naturally. I think it's incumbent, and I think we need to pressure the managers of these groups when they see outliers to re-educate the examiners who are recalcitrant about allowing allowable subject matter early. And I think that is one of the things we need to start pushing. When you see a whole group um, coming out in an area and being known for being problematic with respect to allowances, not tied to the subject matter, um, I think there needs to be some re-education of those particular examiners. Wow, yeah. Yeah, and that, that, that used to happen, right? In, internal exile, Bob. Re-examine. Yep, I, I, it's necessary, John. I mean, that's, you know, we've got a problem, and the way to address it is education, education, education. I don't like penalizing. Penalizing isn't something I want to do, but I do want to educate, and I think that we, that we need to do. Yeah, yeah. So there, um, well, I'm looking at the time, and we're, I mean, there's so much still that we we could we could talk about. But um, John, do you want to add anything to what Bob Bob was saying there? I mean, one of the things that I think maybe we want to talk about because Bob, you you, it's fair to say that the clients that you work with are probably larger entities. Yes, mostly. I do have a couple of small entities and independent inventors, but mostly yeah. larger entities. So I I think that probably the track one is probably better for the uh, maybe startup or uh, maybe even a university startup that needs to get the funding and yeah. needs to get a patent quickly. And, and if that's who you are, but if you're a big entity and you've got a big portfolio, that, that can't be your strategy because that's just going to eat up your patent budget. Well, Gene, I don't, I don't agree with that. I think we had done a paper on your blog a while ago. Um, I think we've done two. And essentially, you are dead on both times that we looked at it that the number of office actions on average for track one applications is lower than that yeah. for non track one applications. Uh, I don't, perhaps it's because of differential examiner assignments, or perhaps it's because the examiners want to hurry up and you know, not prolong prosecution. There might be some pressure there. So, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I believe are, that. But, I, you know, but the thing is, is getting clients to believe that, even when the numbers show it, sometimes is really tough. Yeah. I don't understand why track one is not used more. I just don't get it. I mean, yeah, I think that, we haven't hit that 10,000 quota ever. I, right? I thought that that 10,000 number was going to be blown away. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just, we're not even, you know, it's, it hasn't been touched. 
But, well, we're at the end here, and I want to give each of you an opportunity to, to wrap up. So let, let's go through and, uh, and, and chat with each of you, and we'll just pick the order of the slides. We'll start with Bob and Kate. John, what is the one thing that you would like everybody to remember leaving this webinar today? Bob. Uh, I think that we need to educate. We need to educate the public. We need to make sure they're aware of the importance of innovation. We need to educate the examiners to make sure that they're aware of how important these applications are. This is not a game. This is very important. And I think education is going to be key. All right. Thanks, Bob. Kate. So I think from the applicant side, from the practitioner side, it's very important to keep watching the data because it's changing a lot. So I've been particularly interested lately in the bioinformatics space. I have a few clients there. There's a lot of reasons why the data is changing there. There's a number of different types of court decisions, but most importantly, you just need to be aware of it. And as we were discussing before, there are techniques that once you know what's going on, you can adjust your overall strategy and it will make your prosecution much more effective and efficient. All right. Thank you, Kate. And John, bring us home. Bring us home. Yeah, well, the, the message I have for you is don't give up. Write good applications, that is, that have a plenty of there there. You know, and I, I'm embarrassed, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I look at some of the patents uh, that were written in the software space and there was no there there. You know, it was all talking about outcomes as opposed to how you got from here to there. So write good applications and understand that this will be solved because it has to be solved. You know, you, you want people, for example, like the Cleveland Clinic to actually care about diagnostics. You know, if I have a problem, I want to know the Cleveland Clinic's working on it. And so we've got to encourage the folks out there that would be innovating in this space with the patents that they would have, uh, you know, obtain to create that incentive. This has to be fixed. It will be fixed. Don't give up hope. Write good applications. All right. Well, thank you all for spending uh, a portion of your day with us. And thank you, Bob, Kate, and John for being on the panel. I thought that was an excellent discussion. And thank you, Lexis, Nexus. You've been a great sponsor over the years. If you have any questions about uh, patent optimizer or patent advisor, you can contact Morgan. Her contact information is there. Um, so until next time, you guys have a good day and a good weekend, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Gene.